Agroecological Permaculture Market Garden month of June. Before you ask, no, there's not going to be a creative transition this month from me to Abel. It's not because I can't think of an idea. It's because I got up at half past three this morning to be here while it's still temperate inside the polytunnel. We learned our lesson last month by getting here too late and all three of us were soaking with sweat by the time that we finished. So therefore, bright and early, and I'm gonna give you straight to Abel. So Abel, take over. Welcome back to the polytunnel and to Glass Bren. It's uh, June. You'll probably see around me there's been a lot of change since we were last hitting here. So much so that it was really hard to find our spot again and know where we was hitting. The whole garden and all the tunnels are full now. It's been a really intense month of planting. So inside, we've got our tomatoes climbing up. We've got a bit of sweet corn inside. We've got our French beans. In the other tunnel, we've got our cucumbers, chilies, peppers. And then outside, everything's planted. It's been a really intense month of planting thousands of plants. We've got all our winter squash out there. We have runner beans. We have beetroot, kohlrabi. This week, we've started to do the first kind of big harvesting of, of the summer. So we've got the first range of things. We've got garlic ready, onions. We've got chard, kale, some turnips. Yeah, there's quite a lot going on right now to harvest. A lot's changed since last month. It's been a pretty tough month, actually. We haven't had any rain since we last sat here, I'm pretty sure, or at least just the tiniest amount. So a lot of our store water's run out. Every evening is a big watering mission. We've been really thankful to have our volunteers coming to help with evening sessions as well as the normal weekly volunteer day. Um, that's really helped to keep up with the watering because it's been pretty brutal, pretty relentless. And that is the reality for um, growers at this time of year in general, May and June are really intense times for all growers. Um, so spare a thought for them when you're eating your vegetables tonight. Um, this time's really hard. Uh, but particularly nowadays, every year we get these sort of this sort of climate weirding that's happening and we're getting these longer and longer stretches of um, dry weather. So I remember in 2018, I think it was, we had really brutal six weeks of no rain. Um, that was really tough. And then we're approaching that now actually. Um, this year too, but the, the difference I suppose in the garden is that you can see how much more moisture is being held in the garden in the beds after four or five years of no dig. You can see they have a little more resilience, they're sustaining themselves a little bit longer but even now we're coming to the point where you can see it in the trees, you can see it in the fruit trees and the trees in the garden that they're starting to you know struggle for lack of water now so we're really kind of approaching that emergency point um, where you can really start to see the land getting quite stressed. So this month I'm going to talk about water resilience, how to build water resilience into your gardening setup, your growing setup. I'm also going to share with you some of the ongoing weekly jobs that we have to do like tomato and cucumber pruning and how we do that, as well as answering some of your questions that you might have left in the comments on YouTube or on Instagram or Facebook in the Q&A at the end with Jason. So without further ado, let's get on with this month. So you'll notice since last month, if you watched last month's video, that these beds here have completely transformed from spring cabbages over to tomatoes. So all those hundreds of tomatoes that we had on the nursery beds over there, they've all gone in the ground in the last month. And we've got them tied up on strings and they're already getting really nice and big. They're about halfway up the strings already. So I thought while the polytunnels are still cool, it's still only 7.30 a.m., we might talk about pruning. So this is something that we try to do probably twice a week in a kind of regular intervals to make sure that we're coming through here and keeping these tomatoes pruned. And the reason we do tomato pruning is that we want the tomato plant to focus all its energy in going upwards. Then all its energy needs to go into making fruit because fruit is the most important thing for us from tomato plants. So by pruning them, pruning the lower branches and pruning any side shoots, we can keep airflow going through the tomatoes, which keeps them healthy and less prone to blight. We can also get lots of light onto those tomato fruits to get them to ripen as quickly as possible. The principles of pruning really, I use these little pruning scissors which I got from uh, Reag Tools, reagtools.co.uk um, and they're really handy lightweight pruning scissors for doing this easy job. When we're pruning we're looking for essentially where the plant's trying to make a new leader. So we only want one leader, that's the, the main shoot that's going up the string. Any side shoots that come out and that's a shoot that's shooting out from the elbow between a branch and the main stem and what we want to do is take those off. Now, oftentimes they'll just snap off like that. That's a side shoot. 
but also we can use our pruning scissors to do a bit of a neater job. Make sure we have a nice clean cut. Um, that one's pretty good. And yeah, we continue to do that. And as they grow as well, what I'm doing is taking the lower branches. So really the plant tells you when it's ready to have its lower branches taken off because they start to yellow and it starts to feel like they're not really doing much. And really we want all the energy going up to the upper, upper branches, the upper leaves and to keep that plant going upwards as much as possible. So what we really end up with is kind of a two foot depth of, of leaf, of foliage at the top, and we've defoliated everything at the bottom. So um, in a few months time, you'll see that the tomato plants look very spindly. They're kind of like, you know, naked stems up to about, up to about here, and then it's all foliage from here upwards, um, and all the fruit is down below. So that gives nice airflow, plenty of light for the, for the ripening of the fruit. But it's really important to stay on top of it because in a few days, these plants can get away from you if you're not careful. So keeping it regular, keeping it every once a week or twice a week in a routine really, I think I'd recommend. Okay, so pruning isn't just something we do with tomatoes. It's also really important to do with cucumbers. Some people prune more than others uh, in a market garden setting because we're planting our plants pretty close together. We're kind of trying to get as much produce out of, us, out of the space as possible. So pruning is an important way for us to contain the plant so that we can grow as many plants as possible in a, in a small space. In this polytunnel, for example, we're pruning the cucumbers because we want them to go up and we want to have all the foliage up here in the roof. Uh, and what we do is we prune the lower branches to allow lots of light to come in under the cucumbers. And that, that's really helpful for our companion planting, which we talked about last month, which is where we grow other things like peppers or celery, chilies underneath the cucumbers to grow other things. So it just helps stack up those, those crops uh, in the same space. So pruning with cucumbers is very similar to tomatoes, really. The principle is the same in the sense that we're trying to cut out any new leaders that the plants try to make. Now with cucumbers being a cucurbit, from the sort of the cucurbit family, similar to squash. We'll try to send out lots of new leaders and those leaders will go off and make whole new trails into new cucumbers. So you'd end up with a whole big labyrinth of cucumber plants that would be really hard to harvest from um, in an efficient way as a market gardener. So what we're looking for is nice clean plants going up, all the foliage up here, cucumbers hanging down that are easy to harvest. That's really what we're, what we're looking for. So this plant here is a really good example in the sense that it's down here, you'll see, if you can see in the, in the, between the main stem and the branch here, it's trying to send out a totally new plant. So that's, that's becoming a new plant. It's even got flowers on it. It's even got a little mini cucumber on it. Now it might seem barbaric for me to do this, but what I need to do is take that off, right? Because that's trying to make a whole new leader, a whole new plant. And if I don't stay on top of these things, then um, we'll just have a, a complete forest here that will be really hard to penetrate and, and harvest from. So, and the same uh, over here, we've got another one. So you can see in the, in the crook of the elbow there, um, it sent out a whole new leader. Now a leader can, by, can be identified, you can kind of tell by the end of the, the branch here. It's, it's a leader rather than a leaf. So that's a leaf that just stops where it is. That's a leader that's sort of sending out new plant shoots um, so that's quite distinctive. So that's what you want to look out for. And I'm going to take that one as well. Again, just like tomatoes, it's really easy for the pruning to get away from you. So it's really good to stay on top of it and try to make it a regular thing that you do say every few days, twice a week, um, just to make sure you're on top of it and those leaders don't get away from you because you want all that energy going into the cucumber plant going up uh, into the top. So at times like this, when it's so dry and the land is starting to yellow, we can really start to appreciate the value of water and yeah, the importance of water in growing our food. It might sound obvious that water really is life. Water supports all the food that we grow. But I think a lot of us take it for granted and it definitely helps us carrying water every night for six weeks on end. It really helps us appreciate how important water is and really aware of how much water we're using how much water we need to be storing and how wasteful we can all be in, in our use of water throughout our lives. So um, not just in growing, but in, in general life and living sustainably, living within our limits and living for resilience in the future, we need to really be more mindful and aware of water use, water storage, and also how valuable water is and what an integral part it is to our lives. So that's been a really important part of developing our um, permaculture market garden here is thinking about water resilience. So since uh, a big drought period we had in 2018, we've really been pushed into 
really increasing and developing our rainwater catchment storage. So our entire site, all of our growing works off rainwater. So we don't draw on a well or a borehole or mains water. We only use rainwater catchment. Now in Wales, we have plenty of rainfall, uh, over a thousand mil a year, uh, but more and more that rain is coming all in the winter and we're getting longer and longer dry spells in the summer. So we really need to store water and have it available for the times we need it. So in the garden here, we have a system of industrial bulk containers. These are waste products from industry, picked them up for 40, 40 pounds each. They're nicely cleaned out and we use them. They're a thousand liters each. The benefits of these are multiple. They're nice and neat and contained. They're in a cube shape, so they slot really nicely together or you can stack them on top of each other. They can be moved by a couple of people when they're empty. Uh, they also have these really handy um, sort of cages on them which are really great for growing things up so you can kind of hide the ugliness of them by growing up beans or any kind of climbing plant up them. And what we have is we have rainwater catchment coming off the roof of the packing shed and that kind of travels its way into each of these tanks kind of overflowing into the next one all the way down the hill. So we use the benefit of gravity that we have in our sloping site to move water through the tanks down the hill, right? So we have water available at different points where we need it. Now to make it easier to use that water, rather than running out of a tap, which is a very slow process, we run it into blue barrels like this. Again, waste from agriculture, so we just cut the tops off. And what we can do is just dunk a watering can in, fill the watering can almost instantly and use that. So it really saves time, is much more efficient, makes the water really available to us. Um, this one here, we've got the overflow running into a blue barrel which then runs into the next water tank down the hill. So yeah, there's a bit of plumbing involved in that, a bit of understanding of water levels, water gravity, how water works. But essentially, I'd really recommend making it one of the first things you think about when you're planning a new garden or a new growing site uh, is where the water's gonna come from. And ideally storing water nice and high in your landscape. So if it's a sloping landscape, you wanna have the water as high as possible so that you can use gravity to distribute it through the land. Um, and then there's a few other ways that we can talk about, about how to keep water in your land and not let it run off. Cause there's plenty of rainfall around, especially here in Wales, but we just need to store it, uh, stop it, catch it, um, and keep it where it is to make it available for our plants. So as I mentioned earlier, we're in the middle of a really dry spell here in West Wales. So it's been about five to six weeks without any meaningful rain. That's a really long time for us. And whilst we do have water storage, so we've stored a lot of rainwater catchment over time that's really helped us and kept us resilient to this kind of dry spell. Another really important way that you can develop water resilience in your growing space is by storing water in the soil. Now, one of the reasons we use a no-dig approach to growing is that by adding lots of layers of organic matter constantly, we're really developing and increasing the soil's capacity to hold water. So all of that organic matter is kind of acting like a sponge and sucking in water and holding it there to be available for the plants. We're noticing over many years of doing the no-dig practices that the soil holds more and more water every year. So um, plants that would have suffered kind of four years ago when we had a six week drought period are doing much better now just of their own accord without too much watering. And that really increases our water resilience, increases the amount of time we can survive without any rain. And also, um, yeah, reduces our workload because it means we have to do less watering. By developing a really high level of organic matter in the soil, the soil essentially acts like a sponge. So when we water, that soil sucks in the water very quickly and holds it there to make it available for the plants. So as we get more and more of these strange dry spells here in Wales, as the climate changes and we get climate weirding, we need to think more and more about how we develop water resilience in our growing sites to make sure that we can continue to grow food long into the future, no matter what happens with climate change. So developing water resilience is really key to how you should be thinking about developing an ecological permaculture garden, because resilience is a key principle of permaculture is developing our capacity to produce food and thrive in abundance, knowing that there will be climate change coming, knowing that there will be certain changes to our climate and to our seasonal patterns that we need to be ready and adapted for. So one of those ways is through rainwater catchment, but another way is developing your soil's capacity to hold water. So we're back again for the Q&A part of the video. Thank you everyone who either commented on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, 
asking for other questions or some of you who let us know that you didn't mind the longer form Q&A that we did at the end of last month. So hopefully it's going to be a staple now for the rest of the year as well as for definite I'm probably going to do at least one video if not more that kind of are a lot longer delving into a Q&A between Abel uh, and yourself, uh, sorry Abel and myself as well as including questions from everyone out there. Without further ado, let's crack on. First question comes from Ray Jeff from Instagram. Hello Hi. Ray, this was last month, but we asked too many questions last month, so that's why I said he will be first this month. His question is, how much time and money does it take to run a market garden? I'm curious because I feel the calling to start my own regenerative, regenerative CSA market garden, but lack the proper experience besides growing vegetables in my own garden. Mm. So I wonder whether or not it's not just an idealistic dream in which I underestimate what it'll actually take time-wise and money-wise. So, okay. well. Um, it's a very difficult question, as I'm sure you can imagine, Ray. Uh, because every context is different, everybody's situation is different, different countries are different. If you're not in the UK, it's hard for me to speak to how it would be for you. Um, so I'm going to caveat my answer with a few things, which is that first of all, market gardening isn't our only enterprise or our only stream of revenue. So um, I would say that if, if, if market gardening is your entire business, it's a full-time thing or more than a full-time thing, even if you do it you know, using kind of no-dig agroecological principles that, you know, I know permaculture claims to make life a lot easier, but to be honest, even, you know, ecological market gardening is a very labor-intensive, even even more labor-intensive than conventional farming because there's a lot less use of machinery, fossil fuels, you're relying a lot more on human labor and appropriate technologies and human-scale tools. So um, it is definitely a full-time thing. We have always been a mixture of things. We're a social enterprise as well as a, a market garden. So we've always done, um, you know, work around well-being and mental health. We've done courses and workshops. Uh, we do events and outreach work. Um, so a lot of the time I'm on a laptop, to be honest, as well, uh, running the business and running all the different streams, whether it's funding, marketing, um, planning the crops, uh, talking to members, things like that. Um, so it's hard to say how much time, if you'd like to know how much time on the ground it's been, it's probably been on average three days a week on the ground in the garden. Um, and obviously we do have a lot of volunteer help. So um, that's key part of this is, is like having that influx of people who, who want to help on a weekly basis. So we kind of try to keep those bigger jobs that would really benefit from a lot of people for those days. Uh, and then we do some of the more technical specialist jobs on the other days. Um, so that's kind of how we've done it. Um, money wise, pff, how long is a piece of string? But uh, I, we didn't start with much money at all. Um, so we had the benefit and the privilege of starting up on my family land. So that's made things a lot easier for us compared to folks who need to buy land or rent. So yeah, hard to say you can start on a few thousand. I think you could start on 10,000 um, pounds. That would be quite a nice setup cost if you were willing to use recycled materials, um, you know, repurposed stuff. Uh, if you're willing to sort of develop relationships within the, your community to get sort of free access to organic matter, things like that, you know, wood chip, compost, grass cuttings. Yeah, and keeping it human scale again, like, you know, a lot of big farms and a lot of farms have huge costs because of machinery and because of, you know, big expensive things. We don't have any of those things. Our most expensive tool, I think, was 160 pounds. Um, so, yeah, definitely this way of growing, this this approach to Market gardening, agroecology is a much cheaper way because it relies mostly on your human labor. Um, but it's up to you how you value your time. And obviously, like people always hear farmers say, like you're not going to get a good hourly wage necessarily, or that we don't. I mean, there are farmers out there, uh, you know, regenerative farmers who claim to be earning a city wage from it. Um, good for them. But <laughs> I certainly haven't. But um, yeah, no, it's. Uh, I would say my advice to anyone would be create a diverse revenue stream. So um, five, six different types of income from the same place, um, whether that's stacking your growing system, so having annual vegetables, but as well having perennial vegetables, saving seed to sell maybe, um, making products out of your produce to sort of um, add value to them. All these different ways you can get more value from your vegetables, but also adding in maybe um, courses and workshops or uh, I don't know, events, uh, community events, things like that, fundraising, 
um, work. Yeah, there's lots of different ways to add value to, to a small market garden. You know, I totally agree. Having multiple different income streams is exactly how the way I'm treating this channel and things yeah. is there's certain bits that take a lot of my time and earn hardly anything. Yeah. And then having a mix, but they may be the most fun or the most rewarding or in a market garden terms, yeah. the time is the, the land being taken up yeah. by a particular vegetable, but that vegetable is something that yeah. is a staple maybe. Yeah. Um, but you also have workshops, which in essence, money wise, depending on if you, for like if, if people come here, then yeah. you haven't paid for their petrol, you haven't paid to rent the place and you haven't paid to, if you're just talking, if that if that is the nature of the workshop is just spoken word, mm. you know, it's kind of like for myself, it's not, you haven't have to hire in kit to be able to do the job, mm. you know. There's a, there's a permaculture principle, um, sort of says uh, a yield is theoretically unlimited, right? And it's only limited by your, uh, the information that you have and the imagination that you have. So um, that really has spoken to the way we design this project of like, there are so many different yields you can stack on a market garden. And some of those aren't financial also, like it's really important to say like, this is a lifestyle choice. It's not, it's not because it's gonna make you rich. And if you go into it trying to make you rich, then you're gonna be disappointed. But it's about, um, you know, valuing other yields. And that might be our own sense of lifestyle, well-being, um, peace and contentment at living in, in relationship with nature. But it might also be, you know, for us, it's the volunteers seeing you know, just yesterday we had a conversation with the volunteers about how powerful it is for them, the sort of culture and atmosphere here that's been created and um, how nurturing that is for them. That You know, they, they use this word nurturing and I think that's that's a yield we don't recognise enough in our society and in our lives is, is, is well-being, you know, as a kind of, as an outcome. There's many different factors when you think about success of a, of a permaculture market garden like this. Excellent. Okay, next question comes from a big fan, big friend of the channel, uh, Chanel from Anuna Healing. Hi Chanel. Hello, and the question is, um, so first of all, it was, my question would be, looking to mainly feed just two adults with my little veg patch in my mm -hmm. garden, how many seeds of each type of thing would you recommend to keep a couple people going? Mm -hmm. This is my first year ever growing a few veg and I'm finding it to be very addictive. I'm going to try and answer this in a way that helps as many people out there as possible rather than just Chanel's situation because obviously every single garden is different depending on your size of your garden, your needs as a family, whether you're looking for self-sufficiency or just to supplement your diet with a bit of homegrown veg, which that's most, most people's situation is that they maybe have a few raised beds, they would like to be able to harvest say their own fresh salad, some fruits, some, you know, some veg to supplement their diet to feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm producing my own food which is really great. And I'd, I'd encourage anyone to do that. Um, but that's a very different concept to like really being on the self-sufficiency train where you want to be growing all of your food or all of your vegetables um, yourself, right? So they're two different things. And then again, for us here, it's another different context, um, growing for veg boxes or growing for a bigger market. So um, they all have different contexts, but they all have similar principles for me when it comes to crop planning. I, I think I talked about crop planning a bit last month, but Essentially, you need to sit down, first of all, and ask yourself some core questions, um, no matter what your scale is. And that is, first of all, like, what, what do you like to eat? Like, what things would you really love to, what do you eat a lot of that, that are maybe expensive that you want to save money on? Or what would you really love to eat fresh, straight from your garden? Um, do you like lots of leafy greens? Or, or are you really into the sort of staple, um, typical British vegetables, like your cauliflowers and your broccolis and your carrots? Um, how much time do you have to put into it? That's another factor. Um, what are your resources? Like how much water do you have? Um, yeah, these, these are all questions that you need to ask yourself. And what do you, and then if you're experienced at growing, what do you like growing? So um, I try to focus on the things I like growing because I'm gonna enjoy doing it more. They're gonna be much more likely to be successful because I'll put more work into them. Um, so those just as a start are a few questions to ask yourself, whatever your scale is. In terms of quantities, it's very hard to say, but for example, an onion, so there's different characteristics to the different vegetables, right? So an onion is a store crop, it's something we can store. So we can eat them fresh and they're really nice fresh, um, but we particularly grow onions for storage. So um, we grow those as an overwintering onion, um, actually from sets rather than seed, that's our choice, but that doesn't really matter. 
Um, so you might be thinking to like, I want to grow more onions than I can eat in a onion cropping season because I'm going to store them. Maybe you have the space to dry them and store them. So that's the characteristics of an onion, but then you might have a leafy green, which has a very specific harvesting season. You can't store leafy greens. They will crop and then they'll go to seed. So um, if leafy greens is your thing, then yeah, I guess it's just trying to trying to understand the characteristics of that plant, how much it's going to give you per cutting, right? So um, you might get three or four cuttings from a typical leafy green um, and think about how much roughly per week you're going to eat. There is data out there. Maybe I'll give Jason some links to some data that exists to tell you what the average person consumes of each vegetable per week, because that's what we've used to calculate the quantities for our veg box, which we then use to calculate things around our crop plan so um, that's the best thing I can point you to is to, to find out what what an average consumption would be then look really clearly into your plant characteristics because like a broccoli is going to take up loads of space cast lots of shade it's a really big plant so if you've only got you know small planters it's going to take up a lot of space in that planter um, for a vegetable that actually is quite cheap to buy organically so um, that's another thing to think about is like do I want to be growing the things I can pick up cheaply at an organic shop um, or you know, do I want to grow the things that would cost me a lot to buy from an organic shop? Um, do I want to grow th things that don't take up too much space so I can get as many different vegetables in that limited growing space as possible? Um, and again, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd direct you to last month where we talked about um, companion planting and, and why um, yield and harvest is something we should think about when we're thinking about which plants to go together because uh, we do want to make as much use of the space that we have as possible. I'd say I probably sow 40% more than we need always um, as a backup. Because we, I mean, I talked, I think in the, the month we talked about seeds, I talked about um, how we do most things in modules actually as a choice here. Um, and that's to kind of ensure that we have good spacing, that we're making the best use of seeds. So obviously we're only using the amount of seeds that we need for those modules. And that's quite a conservative way of keeping seed, um, you know, keeping our seed cost down. If I'm direct sowing, it's often things that actually would need to be thinned or might be thinned anyway, like a carrot or a, or a radish might be thinned or parsnips. Are there ways of using uh, things that you're thinning out? In some cases, not, not really in those ones that I mentioned because they're so small and transplanting carrots, for example, doesn't really work very well. Oftentimes you'll get either get really wonky carrots or that will encourage carrot root fly pests like that. It's sort of stimulates them to come and get involved so are there any are there other varieties there's certain things that you can eat is that am i right yeah so for example yeah. you know radish like radish yeah radish microgreens are really nice so you could just eat eat the heads of those um exactly yeah making use of anything that so what you types of what, what microgreens are they uh so yeah radish is a great microgreen i've done um i often do pea shoots as a microgreen that's a really nice one um, what else do we do? We do like golden frills, purple frills. They're kind of a, an Asian leaf, um, salad leaf that we do as a microgreen. I know that's, there were no specifics in there that probably you were looking for, but I, yeah, I would just invite you, I guess, with your crop planning and planning your garden to really understand. There's a really great book I can recommend by John Givons, who's kind of one of the founders of Grow Biointensive, Biointensive Movement. Um, called How to Grow More Vegetables with Less Space, Less Water and Less Something Else. Um, but it's a really, it's got loads of tables in it that sort of show the average yield of different vegetables, their spacings, um, yeah, all the different things you need to factor in when you're planning your veg. Saying that, I would also say don't get too hung up on like making it perfect. I think growing is, you know, if you have a good network of communities or neighbors around you like there's always the opportunity to share produce swap produce preserve produce um, so waste is you know waste is quite a rare thing if you really you know think creatively about how to use things so um yeah i hope that's that's probably what i'm trying to do is provoke some thinking i guess and ask some questions of you when you're thinking about um planning your growing um because you need to ask yourself like you know everybody is different and everybody's got different focus when it comes to growing so um and if it's just about enjoying yourself and the well-being benefits like let go of all that you know agonizing about how much of this and how much of that because you know folks do get really stressed and, and um, tense around those things sometimes and i think it's important to say even at this scale like we're pretty flexible and pretty intuitive about it because it's all about enjoying it as well you know at the end of the day 
hopefully. Hopefully that helps. I'm sure we we'll get. That was told. a lot of talking. If it doesn't help, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that might be why it doesn't help. <laughs> yeah, too much talking. You want a direct yeah. answer. Um, and I think on that note, um, I've still got a couple of other questions. I've got a question from Alicia that we haven't got to yet. Okay. Um, but I think for today, I'm going to leave that there. Please comment your own question, uh, whether it be about starting a market garden, growing in general, whatever, um, and we'll ask it in future videos as well as the video that we're going to do at the end of the season next January. Yep. But for today, thank you again. Thank you very much. Now it's time to go and have an afternoon nap, right? Yeah. It's only <laughs> yeah. 10 a.m. Yeah. Chatting, chatting, chatting. How does that look? Chatting. Ch chatting. 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 I was just winging it. I, well, I don't. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just going to get straight on and let Abel start his. <laughs> just use that. Just use that. Jason, shush. Cough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>